So we are officially recording. So here we go. Um, all right, here we go. All right, thanks for bearing with me. We had a meeting, a graduate student meeting last uh, that lasted a, a little bit long since I kind of get into it a little bit. But I wanted to kind of highlight some of the things that I posted last week. Uh, one of the big things I'm sure I'll mention it a few times is that I am going to be gone first thing tomorrow. I'm going to Puerto Rico for a meeting, University of Arecibo, Puerto Rico, and I'm not going to be back till like Thursday or Tuesday at like midnight. So I'm gone like tomorrow first thing, and I'm gone for like the next six days. So refer all questions to Chima. All pending all questions. If you do have the big things, let me know. I don't know how many hours ahead is the Puerto Rico. What, maybe one. Maybe one at that. Things. I'm going to be. I'm going to still be in communication. <laughs> Even there, but no. But we are doing some neat things with geoscience training at an MSI, focused specifically on uh, Hispanic-speaking students. Um, we're going to look at some of the challenges and barriers that exist. Between Hispanic speaking uh, Spanish speaking students uh, getting their uh, getting their degrees, and so it'll be really kind of interesting. Last week uh, I posted an announcement, and in addition, it might be a day or two before I post this announcement saying what we did because I'll be sitting in airports and all that other stuff with uh, sketchy Wi-Fi. So, so I did post some kind of papers I did before. And then you can see right here, I went and recorded class. So this is a recording of what we did for the two hours. I don't like to stop it and start it again because I'm scared it's going to get lost in the cloud. And I'm still iffy on all this cloud stuff too, like I think a lot of us are, especially when we lose like pictures and photos and all that. And also, I took probably about 35 minutes and I went through and did kind of exercise one so you can start and stop it that spatial join gets real tough real quickly so i'm giving a lot of grace to people who this is the first time they're doing gis i'm not giving grace to cameron or andy but i'm giving grace to most other people who are kind of getting exposed to it for the first time here that's why spatial joins are really tough because you're trying like 102,000 points grouping them all by county and then literally counting them and then we did some things with like average age and Today, we're going to look at normal distributions. Um, we have an ESRI tutorial that's due on the board. It's called GIS Basics, so it might be a change from the syllabus, but just go through and do GIS Basics. Those of you who might have done it before, just do a screenshot or download. Just show me, show me that you, show me that you took it. You know, I've had people kind of go and like photo edit their names. That's great. You know, you can fool Mulroney all you want, but at the end of the day, you're just kind of fooling yourself. You know what I mean? You know, you can fool me and all that other stuff, but don't fool yourself. Uh, don't fool yourself. And there's some good things in there that cover kind of the wide gamut of GIS that I don't want to go and you know, go, go and reinvent. And so the exercises that I have are really specifically focused on things in North Carolina that you, maybe PhD data science students, integrated bioscience, health mappers, Prime analysts or whatever, because if it's instead of cancer deaths, this might be tornadoes. So we're looking at like physical phenomena or environmental phenomena. This might be air quality. And so there's a lot of different phenomena that could be grouped instead of representing these as cancer deaths, we're representing them as something else. So, you know, these things can we can kind of plug and play with these different things as well. Um, once you log into the ESRI training, pick any of the other courses that interest you. And so, like I, I kind of talked to the uh, grad students. You know, if you're applying for a job that says you need metadata training, go to the catalog and type in metadata and take a little class. You know, take the little class that says I did the metadata training, or I did a little bit of Python or ArcGIS online. I've probably taken 30 of these classes. Me, I don't like reading little videos. I like to go and do the hands-on exercise. So that's the best way that I learn. And so you've got these opportunities at your disposal using your NCC username and password that otherwise costs you know, thousands, thousands of dollars. So just be on the lookout. This announcement might not, might not be until you know tomorrow or maybe early the next day because we're going to be having you know Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. We're going to be 
I'm going to be game on in Puerto Rico, and I don't think they're even going to let me watch college football. So I'm really going to be in a bad mood to, uh, you know, get away from the wife and kids, and I can't watch football. <laughs> also, I posted a couple of articles here. So these articles from Environmental Research Health Journal of World Studies, um, Geostatistical Survey of the Relationships Between COVID-19. These are some papers that I have. I want to focus on these a little bit, even though they're posted down at the bottom of modules, because we this is this first one here was done with a PhD student. PhD student in integrated biosciences wrote this, learned GIS, and we went and did this where we looked at African American female breast cancer deaths from this large database of deaths, and we looked at so attached them to socioeconomic patterns because there was a lot of other things that go on in the background that we'll talk about next week with normalizing that we kind of address. We did something with Journal of Rural Studies. What does rural mean? It means you know, how do we quantitatively define rural? I want to quantitatively define it. There's many different ways that we can do that. And then I showed this paper before where we looked at the statistical relationship between COVID-19 and by male COVID rate, uh, by male balloting rates with me and Dr. McGinn, who's another professor in our department. And you notice with a lot of these papers here, I kind of put a little thesis statement right there. This is my working thesis that I can prove or disprove. And I think a lot of times when we put together these papers, we're in such a hurry or a rush, or maybe under such pressure to prove the thesis when that disproving it tells as much of a story as proving it. Now, like this paper right here, this paper right here, we actually proved the opposite, where that there was a negative correlation between COVID and voting patterns. Okay, high COVID didn't necessarily mean lie low by mail. It was still, you know, it meant low by mail. Meaning, if you had high COVID, people were staying home. No, it was the exact opposite of what we looked at. And so, what are some of the other factors attached to that? Because at the end of the day, I'm not the why person. We'll let you all figure out the why. I'm the where person, where this stuff happens. We'll let you all figure out the why. So when I say, hey, it might be related to a um, registered party or whatever, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can make these what we call logical fallacies about, hey, Republicans do this, Democrats do this. We just saw in high Republican areas, these were the voting rates and the COVID rates and all these other things here. And so these are this is, these are some easy reads right here. So if you've got some ideas, kind of those are what we have today. This week we're going to talk about descriptive statistics, and so I'll kind of give my little lecture here. We've got a reading here that I've posted. I think I might extend this a little bit longer here, and then I've got a couple of like in class exercises what of what data looks like to me. What data looks like? So I have things like obesity prevalence rates. Uh, I have an in-class exercise. I think it's related to like school violence rates or things like GPS and income. And so when we calculate GPA, how do you calculate GPA? You just add up all your grades and divide. Sure. What if I had to take a four credit class versus a one credit class? Is the four credit weigh as much as the one credit? No. So we got to kind of, you call them quality points, but they're going to be weighted. Okay, they're going to be weighted. So when we calculate GPA, we're going to look at things called weighted averages because in a few weeks when we apply geospatial data, we're going to look at like population centers, weighted mean population centers. Where's the center of income where we're going to be doing this weighted average? And so I want us to be able to understand these because we're just going to let the computer do it. And do it. We're not going to do any hand calculations with any of this stuff here. So today we're going to do open up Excel a little bit because Excel can do mean, mean, and mode, all that other good stuff. But there will be equivalents for SPSS, SAS, R, all these other kind of more robust software packages that we can look at. So today I'll kind of talk for an hour. We'll take a break and then we are going to kind of look at some of these data sets and kind of answer some of the questions. And then we're going to circle back to the GIS file and you're going to do mean, median, mode, all with the GIS stuff that you calculated last week. And I'm pretty sure this exercise, if you open up exercise two, is the final answer for exercise one. And so you still got to go and make the map on all that other good stuff here. And I want to make sure you understand the idea of the spatial join. But us, you'll see the first couple of weeks of things, these exercises are going to build upon each other. 
And so that's kind of my goal here because, you know, I really like to do stuff related to North Carolina. Okay, I don't care about South Dakota or where the book is or, you know, Maryland, where the, that really good book is. We care about really facilitating state change in the state of North Carolina and use it using robust, high quality data resources that have really been analyzed, uh, analyzed pr professionally. So we're going to understand data, visualizing data distributions. How does data look here? Because a lot of times when we look at data, this is the obesity data that we're looking at right here, you know, and I, I provided it there at the end so we can download it. But at the end of the day, this is what data looks like to me here. I've got a state a prevalence. This CI, does anyone know what that CI stands for? Oh, confidence interval. And so it's 40.1, but it could be as low as 30.8.3 up to 41.9. And so like we're starting to do all this election stuff right now. And so we say, hey, they like one person, they get 45% plus or minus 2%. So essentially that plus or minus 2% is what we call the confidence interval. And it might be skewed slightly in different directions. So this might not be even depending upon the distribution of the data. I don't care about this stuff here. I care about this stuff here. I only care about it if someone kind of yells at me in a paper saying, hey, did you address confidence in a role of market player or all that other good stuff? And we will address that later. And so I'm looking at this. I can make a map of this stuff here. Now we're going to do something called a join. So whenever you find cool GIS data or GISable data, I'm trying to coin the term geopotential data, meaning I can make a map out of this. What does Kansas look like? I was there last month. It's like a big rectangle. And I can color it in a certain color based on its value of 35.7 in relation to everything else because everything is spatially related. And I would bet that obesity, even though you think of it as an individual level problem, right? You know, like it, it's a combination of diet, exercise, genetic predisposition. It's not really, I don't think it's related to place and space, but I bet you when we map it, it is, right? So I can go and make a map out of it and boom, look, there it is. That's interesting. And then we've got a sufficient data, uh, insufficient data right there, but there it is. Colorado is really low. Why? What are they doing in Colorado? I don't know. A lot of mountains, I guess you got to climb or whatever. And so this is the data where it's high, it's high, where it's low, it's low. First law of geography, high stuff near other high stuff, low stuff near other low stuff, right? That's the whole idea of geography. So what do we do with it? Now that we have tabular data, we can look at different cohorts of data. Okay? So, hey, what do we know about these kind of... There's not too many greens, greens and whites, and these versus these. Right? What can we do? We can look at the averages of these. If we can look at the average of incomes of all the highs versus the lows, there's going to be a difference where the chances are different. So that's kind of what we're going to do something called the two tail T test. I like that. We'll talk about that much later. So we use GIS techniques to set, select different cohorts of high availability versus low availability, high COVID rates versus low COVID rates. What's the difference in income between your high COVID rates and low COVID rates? If one of them is, you know, income of $50,000 versus $20,000, what are the chances of that happening? What are the chances of we, us looking at that and having such a difference? I kind of think of looking at it, averaging the height of people. You know, if we were just going to go take someone's height right here, Chima, I picked Chima and his height is going to represent the height of everyone for, across NCCU campus. You think that's fair? Well, he's really tall. What if I pick someone that was short? What if I pick two people? All right, that's a little better. What if I pick three people? A little bit better. What if I picked everyone? That's really good, but a really waste of time. So there's a happy medium between having this adequate sample size and margins of error to tell that they're different. So we could say, hey, the height of everyone on the NCCU campus is higher than the height of everyone over at the NCA campus or whatever. And so we can create a statistical test to do this. Now we do this geographically. Hey. What are the COVID rates in Cumberland County versus Robeson County? Now we can do these select by locations. We've talked about these before. How many cancer deaths occurred in Durham County? You all know how to do that. What's the average age of those cancer deaths? How many of them are under the age of 30? 
And so we can do this GIS wise as well. And so we've got these block groups right here. Now, the big thing with these is that there's a lot of data prep that kind of goes into these. So most of the work we're going to be doing in this class, I'm going to give you a lot of the data. Now, Cameron can tell you putting together all that death data, probably what took you half a day to go through and do all that stuff. But he got has a list of everyone who died, you know, just the stuff that we looked at last week. He's got a list of everyone who died over the last what 20 years, 22 years, something like that. That's a really big file and it changes and ugh, it gets kind of you know ugly. So if you want to do your research like Cameron or Alana, who did the uh, the PhD student who did that research, hey, you're gonna have to kind of do some data prep. And those are some of the kind of the back end techniques that we talk about, we can sit down and look at because that's your biggest investment. Doing all this stuff here is pretty fun, pretty cool. It makes fine and sexy graphs, but you know, it needs to be based on kind of high quality data. I provided all the cancer deaths that you can count on average age and all that other good stuff. But at some point in time, my cancer deaths from like 2005 to 2010, you might want to go get brand new stuff. Yeah, and I had to go through something called an IRB. Has anyone ever heard of an IRB? It's called Internal Review Board. So if you want to get individual level data about people, whether it's health data or whatever, you have to go apply to this and they're really care it takes so long that's why i like doing gis stuff with stuff grouped at the block group level and census track level because i don't have to go get irbs so now i can compare the income for one area versus another area so we can look at descriptive metrics so this two tail piece now has i'm talking about just comparing the means of two values but what does the mean mean no pun intended um we have descriptive statistics. So when we look at descriptive statistics, these are what we call global statistics. They describe an entire database. Your favorite football team, what are some descriptive statistics? How many games did they win this year? You know, we're talking about American. Oh, we're talking about Arsenal and all the other folks there or whoever, Chelsea or whatever. Okay, American, we're starting up next week. So things like that, okay? You know, what are their average number of wins over the last five years? How many points did they score? What is the range of wins valued by season or whatever? And so those are descriptive metrics that describe an entire data set. Like, what's my GPS? How many wins is my favorite football team win per year versus my rival? How much variability is there in the number of wins? So we'll talk about variability. So we have this term called standard deviation. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Now, we've got... Really powerful tools in Excel that allow us to do this. So we can just type in these nice little formulas and do this where we don't need to elicit the use of SPSS and R, even though they do lots of other stuff that we won't talk about in this class. What's the average COVID rate in North Carolina by zip code? What percentage of people live in food deserts and urban regions versus rural regions? You know, it's actually higher in rural regions than urban regions. The percentage of people that live in Food deserts are live in food insecurity. Now we think more about urban regions because there's a much higher population of urban regions. So if you look down at the bottom, we have Dr. McGinn, and my wife actually worked on it a little bit, part of a sociology paper on you know this kind of urban myth about food deserts. Food deserts really are much more prevalent in rural areas, you know, urban, uh, rural areas, but we kind of associate those with urban areas a lot more. So measures of central tendency, meaning I want to describe how centralized, and this is called a global metric, because eventually what we're going to look at is something called a local metric. So when we start doing clustering, cluster analysis, hot spots, cold spots, we're going to look at local metrics versus global metrics. And we got some easy ones here. Mainly we'll look at how do we calculate these, how do we visualize these in ArcGIS Pro and in Excel. So I want to make sure we get to those, and I want to make sure we're able to open up Excel, we're able to open up ArcGIS Pro. And after last week, we all should be able to open it up, unzip it, and all that other good stuff as well. And make some pretty graphs, because those pretty graphs, I can export those graphs, just plop those right into a paper or a PowerPoint. And so when we start describing, hey, I'm writing up a paper, I'm a social work student, we have social work students, at the very least, I'm looking at this area. 
The average income of the three zip codes is seventeen thousand dollars. Percentage of students who don't speak English as the first language is this. These are all really good descriptive metrics that tell powerful stories that don't elicit the use of any advanced statistical analysis like this two-tailed t test or correlation or regression or any of this kind of ugly stuff that we're going to get into later. And by that ugly stuff helped reinforce, you know, hypotheses that we can make. You know, these hypotheses, we see these things all of the time. And a lot of times we really doubt or we wonder how to prove them or disprove them. So we have something called the mode. A mode is the value that occurs the most. A median is the middle. And the mean is basically what we call the average. Add up all the numbers, divide by the total number of values. And we see this all the time. You can look at the test, you know, your test in, you know, Canvas or Blackboard or whatever. And I think, are you able to see, are you all able to see the average for all the scores or no? I can. You know, I, I can see the average. So if I say, hey, the average is 68, I'm going to scale that thing up. You know, scale that thing up to a 60. No, no. We'll scale it up to, you know, an 80 or whatever, you know. And so that mean is important there. Now, me personally, I like the median a lot better. Okay, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why in a little bit. Now, a lot of times in statistics and the books that I give you, I, we get all these like nasty formulas. And I, I hate looking at those because at the end of the day, what we're going to do is we're going to put it into Excel. We're going to type in a little formula and we're going to put equals average. And we're going to highlight all the numbers we want to average and move on with our life. And so I don't like these things here, but all this little sigma notation means is all it means is add them all up. Add up all the numbers and divide by the total number of numbers. One over n times sigma. That's all it means. That's all it means. So you add up all the numbers, add up all the scores in class, divide by the total number of students, you get the average. Okay. So the good thing about it is it's easy to compute, it's sensitive to extreme values. Where that me, I like looking at me medians a little bit more because. They are not susceptible to outliers. Okay, which basically means, you know, we look at a country like, you know, Qatar or United Arab Emirates. What are some of the things you heard about during the World Cup with Qatar or Qatar? Was that it's too hot, way too hot. But what do you hear about the workers? And basically, these are all people from like Malaysia and India who made like next to nothing. And so when you actually look at the average income in some of these countries, it's like 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10 million. What does that do to the average? It gives it up. Okay. Where that, you know, we have the medium of 10 million, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. It's, it's going to be really low. And so I like median. So a lot of times when we look at some of the metrics for each of these, it is not susceptible to outliers. So We'll have differences in median household income versus mean household income. Now, the thing is, you got to sort the data and calculate it. So you just go through and add them all up in Excel, where it takes it's a little bit harder to do that in median. And so that it's literally like the middle number. So if I have numbers like 52, 55, and 57, the middle number is going to be 55, the middle. But what's the middle of four numbers? Let's go back to the number, you know what I mean? There you go. But what's the middle of four? Well, there is a middle. Let's so you get two on one side, two on the other. You know. So how do you calculate the mean? You got to average up the two middle. Well, totally different thing. They're a totally different metric. And so median is going to be a little bit fickle, depending upon if you have an odd number, which has a true middle, versus an even number where you're going to. At the end of the day, you still use that average, but that average is going to be somewhere in the middle of that data set. So those are those are those are important there. And then you got to sort them. You know, sorting is kind of really hard if you think about it. How do you sort a bunch of numbers in a program? Maybe we should do that next time in data science class. Who took data? You guys took data science. That'd be pretty fun. Wouldn't that be pretty fun? Like different sorting algorithms. It was easy to sort. Remember, we started doing like those Pythagorean triples and it like crashed our computer. Because you're like sorting through all these things and it got really ugly really quickly. So, you know, the number of calculations that we do. Because when we visualize these, ArcGIS Pro loves creating these things called histograms. Okay. 
I love these histograms too, because it's a good visualization of the data. And then ArcGIS Pro can put a little line here with the mean, the median, and the standard deviation right there. And then I can do a little screenshot or right mouse click and export and stick it into Word or PowerPoint or whatever else these days to rapidly display these data. Because to me, I like data like this. It's high in the middle, low on the end. This is what we call a normal distribution. Now, in ArcGIS Pro, these things are called bins. And then I like kind of vacillate between ArcGIS Pro and Excel with my statistical analysis. I'll use R and other stuff for more advanced stuff outside of this class. But in ArcGIS Pro, they're called bins. And so one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven bins right here. You could have 10, 15, 20. You go and change it however they eat and however they look. Okay, but this is what we call normal distribution here because of that we have various types of distribution. It could be skewed to the right, skewed to the left, bimodal, multimodal. Me, I'm a big fan of kind of normal distribution. It's high in the middle, low on the ends. And you can think about this with like, hey, our football teams, your typical American football team. How many are they going to win? You know, everyone talks about we're going to win 14 games this year. We're going to win. No, you're not. You're probably going to win between what? Seven and nine. That's most of the teams are going to win between seven and nine. You're going to have the Panthers win like one. What was it? One last year? You might have the Panthers win like one. You know, you might have, what was it? Eagles not. We might have if someone went 14. I don't think anyone went 14. But someone went, you know, 13 or 14. You never have anyone with 17. Troy, they were two seats. So San Francisco must have won. I thought they were like 13 and four or something like that. I don't think anyone won 15, but um, 15 or 16. I'm definitely not 17. But, um, but that's typically what you see. Most of your teams are going to win between you know, six, seven, eight, nine, so somewhere in that. And we've got nine and eight teams that make the playoffs all the time because they're kind of kind of stuck in that stuck in that middle there. So when we look at normal distributions, that's typically what we look at here. And so we look at something like the median household income for these descriptive statistics right here. And I can write mouse click, I can create histograms that give you the count, the min, the max, the sum, the mean, the standard deviation. We'll talk about what that standard deviation means in a little bit, because that's another global descriptive descriptive metric. Global describes the entire data set as opposed to local because we're gonna to start to look at things called Z scores, which are gonna be local, individual for each and every entry. And so we can look at frequency distribution here. You can see it's kind of bimodal right here, but at the end of the day, it's low on this extreme, low on this extreme, high in the middle, depending upon the data. And so we can create histograms of ArcGIS Pro, and I just right mouse click on it, and we're gonna do this later. We're gonna right mouse click, I'm gonna click on statistics, and it's going to give you all this stuff right here. Mean, median, standard deviation, count, min, max, sum. We got them all right here ready to go. And so when you write a paper or you put together some type of concept, you got a data set right here. Before we even start looking at socioeconomic association between female African American breast cancer death rates, we can look at the female African American breast cancer death rates and say, hey, this is the min, this is the max, this is the average. These are all these other things. Hey, let's look at the non-African American and say, hey, the rate is like 10 years more. There's a difference between these. And then we can start to use our statistical tools, our two-tail t-tests to look at the differences between these. But we've got really, we can tell some really powerful things between these main median modes between two different cohorts, just two different cohorts. Uh, let's look at the urban versus the rural that we can pick out. But at the end of the day, we've got this kind of histogram. Now, this histogram is interactive. So if I've got my mouse right here, and I and this is median age. And so this is median age by county. So there are some counties, the median age, half the people are over the age of 49.5, half the people are younger than the age of 49.5. We've got some counties up here. We've got counties down here that are like 25.9, the median age. Now, what county do you think that is? What county? Have you heard this one before? It's been a while, so, you know. 
Uh, close. Watauga, it's Onslow. What, what's in Onslow County? We're, we got Camp Lejeune. You're close because Watauga's next, Jackson's next, and then you kind of throw in Orange and Wake because Wake does have some older people there. But when we map, you know, age, it's going to be really low out here except for where App is, where Western Carolina is, where Asheville is, everything else is old. Okay, but they're spatially related. But this map is interactive. So I can highlight this little bin right here. You notice right here, I've got bin. So I've got 10 of these bins. I can right mouse click and look what I can do. I can export this thing, pop it off to Excel or not Excel, Word, PowerPoint, or whatever. Or it's me these days, I'm big into screen capture. Screen capture, flip it, send it off here. But you know, the one thing about that, it treats it as like an image on a clipboard as opposed to like a dedicated JPEG or TIFF or whatever that has a dedicated name to it. But now I've got mean, median, standard deviation. I've got little graphs on it right there, little lines right there. Stick that into a paper. This describes, hey, median age. African-American breast cancer death rates versus what? Versus non-African-American versus majority versus minority or any type of comparison. How do these things change? And when the woman did this, she found really neat with the distribution of African-American was like here, where that everyone else was like here, meaning they were like dying later. Do you think that's a coincidence? I don't think so either. And we use some statistical tools to go and definitely prove and disprove that. So we have different types of distributions. Anyone remember Wordle back in the day? Wordle, you kind of pick a word and you know you, you put in a word. It's a five-letter word. And it tells you what word you know what letters you have right. Uh, it's big during COVID. But to me, this is kind of normal distribution here. All right. I, Two guesses or whatever. How many guesses it took you to get the word? Um, some other types of normal distribution. This is the 2020 NFL combine, and I extracted out the 40 yard times for all the people. So that there it is. So we had someone running 4.27 all the way up to 5.62. So these are the 40 times extracted out from the NFL combine. Now in the combine it is where's now Indianapolis every year. Or basically, it's like a big meat market where all the, you know, right? It's a, you know, basically where they do broad, you know, potential kids, not kids, like men, you know, who are trying out for the NFL go and, you know, they take their height and weight and 40 times vertical. And I think they do it by position and everything else. And people like me go and extract it out and grab it and bring it into Excel and do all this neat stuff with it. I might have done this in Excel because I didn't want to bring it into. I might have done this in Excel because I didn't want to bring it into ArcGIS Pro. But you can bring this into ArcGIS Pro as a CSV file, comma separated value, just because ArcGIS Pro doesn't like working with Excel at times because it doesn't know how to reconcile those little tabs like sheet one, sheet two, sheet three. And you run into problems because it starts putting dollar signs on them. And dollar signs and file names get really ugly really quickly. But I know there's attachments to these. I just don't want to bother and learn the attachment. So, so I did this in Excel. To me, it's a little harder to do this. I think you got to run like some sort of pivot table thing or something like that. And so I'll just do it in ArcGIS Pro. And so, and this is the NFL. This is the number of wins from 2019 to 2020. So you can see all how many NFL teams are there. 32. Times two seasons, so like 64 team seasons or whatever. So you can see there was a one all the way up to, I guess this is 16 or whatever right here. And so you can see your team right here, you know, about a third of the teams are going to win between this and that. So you got some stinkers and you got some good ones right there. Now we have something here called weighted mean. You all do weighted means every day or on a regular basis. When you calculate your GPA, so you now in our grad program, we mainly have like three credit classes. But if we had a one credit class or whatever, it might be a little bit different. So it's similar to arithmetic mean. So the arithmetic mean you just add them up, divide by the number. But data points contribute equally. Here, different data points contribute differently. Now, what might a county have different number of population? 
Okay. And next week we'll talk about normalization where that if I were to map like each county by the total number of DUI deaths, Wake County is probably going to be the highest. And you're all going to say, of course, you just met the expectations. And so we need to go and reconcile this. And then while, next week we'll talk about something called um, age trading, which also kind of reconciles the averaging of the average, which get ugly quickly. And so if we were to map something like this, median household income, well, this median household income has a high population versus 926, which has a low population here. So in theory, when, if we were to create a weighted average of the mean population income or percent of people receiving public assistance or percent minority or whatever some of these things are that are already normalized, in theory, we'd want to create a weighted average of these. Now, how do you create, tell me in words, how do you create a weighted average on your GPA? How do you create a how do you create a weighted average on your GPA? Just use that computer to figure out what it works. Okay, you got an A, which is what? Four. Okay, and how many credits? So this is your grade credits. So this is a three credit class. You got you got a D, one credit class, you got an A and four credit class, and then C, you got another C, three credits. So we went and took how what? 11 credits for the campus. Yeah, we took 12 credits. All right, so this is 12 credits for you. Right? But how, how do you calculate the GPA? And what, does anyone know what this is called on your transcript? Stands for QP quality points exactly. These are quality points. What basically are they? The value times the credit. What is really the credit? It's the weight or the population. So really, this four is counting more than this one. So we go and add them all up. So twelve plus two plus sixteen plus eight. It's pretty late to do math, but fourteen. So this is thirty-eight. And then what do we divide it by? Well. Is equal to what? Degrees point one And what happens when we just average it up here? For um, grade four plus two, but you would have gotten a three. Would you rather have the three than three point one six 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 six? Why? Because you got what? You got the, you know, you got the A the four credit class. Why well, you do too well in the one credit class. And I'm just pointing this out to people right here joining us online. You guys see that? Okay. So we were just doing a calculation with your grades versus the credits to calculate the quality points. This is that weight. This is the weight. This is the grade. And then we kind of add them all together, add them all, and divide by the total number of credits. And so can you do this in Excel? That you we, all we do is just kind of multiply them together, add them all up, and we have to hand jam and calculate anything. We better not. Maybe you better not. If you are, then I promise. So as you think later, we're gonna have something called spatial mean, spatial mode, spatially weighted mean, spatially weighted mode, spatially weighted median. And so as you can uh, have an idea, we're just gonna start. I don't care like location, I have two longitudes. Worry about that for three or four weeks. Okay. So we've got some really neat metrics right there that we can look at. Okay. So we have more contribution versus less contribution. Once again, we have these silly formulas right here. All this means is this is the average divided by the sum of the weights. Okay. So the average, this is that quality points divided by the total number of credits right here. Okay, so the weights are the credits and the sum of the value times the weight equals that quality point thing right there. So whenever we create weighted means, kind of in the last 
couple of times I've taught this class is let me find how you calculate your GPA. You want 3.0 or you want 3.16? I don't know. Maybe I'm going to round that up to 3.2. I'm good day, I might round that up to like 3.5 or something like that. You know what I mean? So I had a 2.98 as an undergrad. So I, I just, yeah, I was a 3 0 student. We're, we're looking on first. So, same thing right here. Now, we're going to go do this in Excel where that we have a population and the median household income. Where that, all right, this is the weight, your credits. This is the value. Let's just multiply them together, add them all up, and divide by the total population. We're going to do this by hand at the end of the break, after the break here. Okay, so we can do this weighted average. We can call it quality points or whatever. It makes you feel better. And so we can do mean, median, standard deviation, variance, and then weighted average right there. So these are all things by the end of the day that we're going to do in Excel. All right. All things we can do in Excel. Now we have measures of dispersion. What is the min, the max, the range? This is another great thing that we can do. So when we look at African American female breast cancer death rate, we can look at what's the min, what's the max, what's the range of values, high minus low. Range is always going to be a positive number. Okay, so if the range of death was four to ninety-eight. It's not 4 98, it's nine, highest minus lowest, which is 94. So it's always going to be a positive number. Okay, these numbers, like when you break mouse click and click on statistics, they give you these things ready to go. Other things we have are called mean deviation, variance, and standard deviation. We do all this nasty stuff when we look for the difference between. The max in each of the values, the, the mean in each of the values, because this mean is going to be pervasive, not only in variance, when we start looking at hot spots and clustering some of these local metrics about what this mean is. But basically, standard deviation is how far it is away from the mean. That's all it means. And so we can have two values that have the same mean, but different standard deviations. So you can look at football teams like the Panthers win one and they win 11 and they win two and then win, you know, 14. They have a high standard deviation as opposed to a team that wins eight and nine and eight and nine and ten and six, which are all located about that mean. And so they got the same mean. So we've got another descriptive metric that basically describes the volatility of each of the individual values. Now, when we look at this. Here, we've got all these like nasty differences and we add all this stuff up and we stay the square root. But at the end of the day, we're just gonna look at the standard deviation because that standard deviation is gonna have a good relationship between that normal histogram that we have right here. Okay. So when we look at one of these things here, we have the variance. We can go and calculate the variance in the standard deviation really easily using Excel. So there's no need to go and calculate things like mean deviations and squaring. They don't, don't waste your time. Okay, this isn't. I was gonna say this isn't a stats. It really is a stats class. Okay, but more importantly to me, is how do you apply it? Can you tell me what the mean is? What does the mean mean? No pun intended. What's the median mean? Okay, how can you apply these to the real world data you're working with? Go take a math class upstairs or whatever if you want to. Do these calculations by hand. Excel does them all for us. You, know, you being able to interpret those and really effectively communicate those, not to me, but to your nine year old kid, your 90 year old grandmother, whoever can understand those are, I think, of utmost importance. And so the most common distribution we have here is what we call a normal distribution. And then next week, we're going to talk about how do we normalize data because. When we start looking at like Z scores and standard deviations for population by county, where we have million, 900,000, 600,000, and we've got 20 counties that are all the way on this end between, you know, 20,000 and 100,000, that's not a normal distribution. So I always like looking at normal distributions because they fit nicely and neatly into this curve. And then we can go to my ArcGIS Pro and we can look at both sides with the standard deviation, the mean in the middle, and the mean and the mean really close to each other, which I really like. And so we can visualize that standard deviation. 
So they're typically symmetric or bell shaped. This is what I strive for, but you know, I, I kind of had a bi molar one before, but it was still low on the ends. And so when we look at normal distributions, in theory, most of your data, kind of like your wind data by football team or baseball team or whatever, we're looking at about two thirds of your data is between negative one and positive one standard deviations. That's what we're looking at here. Okay, standard deviations are really, really powerful. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. Why are so important? Okay, I like standard deviations. I know Chima does too. And we'll so maybe we'll let Chima explain in a little bit why he likes those. Um, we have characteristics of distribution where we have positive skewed, negative skewed, all these other things here. They're still relatively normal, but they look kind of like this. I don't like data like this. Because the z-score is what we call a local metric, meaning we can standardize it using a nice little formula. So I can compare data and values to other data sets. I've got a formula right here. Okay. A z-score is positive if the data lies above the mean, negative if it lies below the mean. Here's my little formula right here. My z-score is equal to x. X is the value. And so the median household income for Durham minus the average of all those values divided by the standard deviation. Okay. Now, we'll let Chima explain why does Chima love z-scores? Why does Dr. Mulroney love z-scores? Metrics. Yeah. So we had a and all those indicators. So we wanted to have a way to be able to interpret the data from the different system. Like so I cannot say this is my best. It's Less than zero, you should say, it's up to so, so, 10 if it was more than it. Yes. So, it's Exactly, yeah. No, definitely. The other thing we have here, X, we've got the highest county right here calculating the Z score. So, this Z score, now this Z score, let me get these students here that are joining us live. This thing is kind of going out a little bit. So it's 49.5 years minus 39.5 years, which is 10 years divided by 5.2 years. What happens to the units? Yeah, they go away. So what are the units for a Z score? Trick question. There are no units. There are no units. So when I say, hey, for age, the z-score is, and this z-score is approximately like 1.9, positive 1.9, where that for income, the z-score is negative 2.3. Hey, we know that for income or for age, it's really high above the mean, or income is below the mean, because when we start creating these metrics, and a lot of times people, we start to hear about these things like social vulnerability metrics. We want to look at marginalized population. What does marginalized mean? How do you measure marginalized percent minority or average age percentage of people who don't have um, who don't have access to transportation? Uh, median age, income. What are all the units attached to those? Dollars, years, percentages, all this other stuff. Can I just add up those values and it makes sense? No, it's like adding up 5x plus 3y plus 2z. What's 5x plus 3y plus 2z? 5x plus 2y plus 3z. You can't do anything with them. So the same thing with these z scores where that, hey, let's convert it all to a z score. And hey, maybe I can add up all these z scores to see where they play into this. Now, can you explain z scores to your grandmother? Or, you know, me, I'll just probably make it most vulnerable to least vulnerable and, you know, get rid of all the numbers. You know what I mean? And then scaling those where that percentage of people who have access to transportation, 
high is good, but median age, high is bad. Or not bad, but you know what I mean, more vulnerable. And so you really need to make sure you scale these properly. And those are some of the things that Chima, I think, has done really good with. Having a good and holistic understanding of the data is, is important. You know, I, I can't stress it. Um, it's, it's really important. And so what we're going to do here in class, we're going to open up a couple of data sets. Let's take like a 10 minute break here. We're going to go to Excel and then we're going to go to ArcGIS Pro. We'll open up the Excel file first. We'll look at it just a couple of different files here. We'll open up the ArcGIS Pro file here and then hopefully I'll kind of send you off to do your homework and you should be good to go here. So let's take about 10 minutes. We'll meet back here about 6 10. Can everyone hear me online? I think you can. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Just making yes, sure. Sir. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. well, that's good. Yeah, I know these guys are awesome. Oh, uh, like I said, he's probably more. <laughs> Visualize <laughs> that. It's not going to be a good thing. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> 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 I know, I want to ask you, because can you give the numbers? We did it yesterday, so I'm like, so I'll actually go one more so we can keep it. That's what's going on. We're going to just spread them in the photo. Sorry, I got this. Don't get this here. I miss Thank you. 
It's like the evening class last year. So, I know exactly. I know a lot of time for me. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know that. I have a 
It's the rock saw. That's fair. Uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. I don't know if you have a folder. Oh, okay. I didn't make sure. I'm sorry. I'm loving things all. I don't know. I don't know. It's very good. <laughs> Uh, I will give everyone about a minute or two and then Let's get to open up our modules right there because I want to make sure we can look at some of this stuff. Right, and let me go get a good marker because I want to make sure everyone can see that. So I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to go get a marker. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, why don't we start here? Well, I got a couple questions up here. We'll get to these later because the things I want to do is I just want to make sure we're able to kind of open up data sitting in Excel, and then we're going to do the same thing in ArcGIS Pro, but hopefully it won't take us as much time to open up everything in ArcGIS Pro. So we'll do a lot of these calculations here. And so I'm going to click escape right here. And I'm going to open up my mo my modules right here. Now, a couple of things here. I've got some in-class exercises. I've got some uh, obesity prevalence rates. I've got some income. These are just different kind of types of data that we can look at here. So I think we're going to look at the in-class exercise, but if we were to look at like obesity prevalence rates and download these, these are what we call a CSV file. Has everyone heard of our CSV file? Comma separated values. That's all it means. I like CSV files because you can bring those nice and neat into ArcGIS and it doesn't care about tabs and all that other stuff that Excel brings with it. So if you were to open this thing up in Excel, it would open up just with one sheet, you know, basically just one sheet. So I can right mouse click, save link as, and these are kind of all my tricks here. And so week two, 2022, overall obesity prevalence rates, and we can map these. And so now I can go to my downloads. I have CSV file. You notice the little icon right there. That means it opens it up in Excel. If I were to open this up in Word or like Notepad, it would look really funny, okay? And so this is what we have right here. And so when we actually start to look at data, so if I were to like right mouse click, open with say Notepad, this is actually what it looks like. This is what it looks like. And so when you open this set up in Excel, basically Excel says, hey, wherever I see a comma, just move over a cell, move over a cell, move over a cell. And so later this semester, when we start looking at things like data from the Climate Prediction Center, it's saved as a TXT file. You'll see the little commas there. We can bring that straight into ArcGIS Pro because ArcGIS Pro is smart enough to say, hey, these commas mean move over a comma. Now it gets problematic if you see like random commas in places random commas in places where you're supposed to be commas and not line separators. And that stuff gets really wacky. And that's where you earn your big bucks, data wrangling, data cleaning, some of those nasty things we kind of talked about in data science where everything doesn't come in nicely and neatly. What do I do next? This is where you earn your big bucks. This is where Cameron earns his big bucks that I'm just going to take his data set and do nothing with because he went through the trouble of doing it where they change schema or whatever or things that don't line up. That's where you're in the big bucks. Here, we're not earning big bucks. We're just kind of going through and you looking at a couple of examples of these data sets. And I think I posted a link for these too because most of us like to look at the end products of these anyway, with the maps and the graphs and the charts and all this other stuff. So this is what data looks like, because most of the time in my GIS world, this is what my specialty, is I want to kind of map all these things and I can do something called a join. We won't talk, uh, we won't talk about a join today, but as you can imagine, it's a lot like that spatial join that we talked about. I also have another one here where it was like GPA and income. This is an Excel one. And so maybe if we have an exam or a quiz or anything like that, I'm going to just right mouse click, save as. Okay. And you notice here, this, you might want to use this or have this open when we're going through and doing, um, uh, you're going through and doing the, uh, doing your midterm exam where the, oh, there's my Excel. One more. Save link as. Oh, saving it in documents. Let's just save it in downloads. 
Okay. There we go. Okay. It's not sorting it by date, it's sorting it by name. Okay. So this descriptive here, this is an Excel file. This is an Excel file. And you notice here what I did, and just for the heck of it right here, I did per capita income, median household income. What's the word per capita mean? What's per capita mean? Why are they so different? Capita means per person. So basically the total amount of income in trillions or billions, whatever that number is, divided by population where that, this is median household income. We lined up every income in the state. This is the middle income. And so these numbers per capita income is per person, but how many like wage earners are typically in a household? One, two, maybe sometimes three, whatever, okay? And we have things called family. Sometimes you see the word family. What's a family? What's the difference between a household and a family? Household, family, people are related. Household, they're not. So you see all these metrics where we see, kind of take these. Now, what I have here, I have this thing called like quality points where basically I'm kind of doing a GPA calculation here, but C2 times D2. And then I'm doing a z-score because we're going to go through and calculate these for the in-class exercise where we look at school violence rates or something like that. So we're going to do that. But I have these formulas up here up in the upper left. So I want to make sure we do this because I know most people, how many people are familiar with Excel have used it before? How many people have done like cal formulas and calculations and all that? Okay. So most of these are going to be pretty straight. How many people have done Poisson distributions in Excel? All right, good. You're going to learn something in this class. Okay. All right. Good. Poisson distribution is just a fancy way of saying a random distribution. So I, you know, but that'll be that'll be later. But we can do all these neat things. I could do like stock stuff and everything else in Excel. Did anyone realize that you can like pull up stock information? It's pretty cool. And so I can like track my stock that you know my stocks that I have throughout the you know throughout the year or whatever. And it's really neat. Um, I need to kind of look at that, but what we're going to look at right now is we're going to look at the in class exercise week 2. And we're just going to download this thing. So, right here, I'm going to right mouse click do save link as save it wherever you want. This is called in class exercise week 2. I'm just going to click save. And then I'm going to open it up right here. There it is. Come on. Look at all the stuff I've been saving this week. But I got to save it in the right place. Save link as I'm going to save mine in downloads. Okay, it's serious. Downloads. Am I being silly or no? Okay, in class exercise week two. All right, these are some data that I got from uh, Department of Public Instruction. Um, you know, I got kids school age. I, I used to have kids school age left, and we're actually homeschooling them right now. But we'll see how that goes. So what we're looking at here, the one thing about this is how many school districts are there in North Carolina? Because get a good understanding of the data, because we've had we had a student, a social work student, who went and did like school analysis looking at um, he was looking at um, EOG scores versus socioeconomic indicators and looking for outliers, meaning where are low achieving neighbor, predictably low achieving neighborhoods, but high achieving schools based on income, age, a lot of like socioeconomic metrics. What are they doing in these schools that where they're predictably low that are they're doing so well? And so, and vice versa, hey, 
high income neighborhood and all these other metrics attached to high performing schools, but they're performing lower than expected based on a simple regression model. And so we've kind of gone through this data because believe it or not, all of the Department of Public Instruction data, you can go get it there. Now, they don't make it readily available to people. Why? People will research it and say, hey, there's been five sexual assaults at my kid's elementary school and no one wants to go there. <laughs> you know, and I see, I see that stuff happen and you see some really sketchy stuff having kids in high school. I don't want to go into my tirades, but I like to keep all this stuff real internal. So, like, I know there was a sexual assault in this school last year. The neighbors were all talking about it, but it's not in the data set. What's going on? You know, what's going on there? You know, well, it technically wasn't a sexual assault. It was downgraded to an assault. And, you know, all this other kind of weird stuff when you deal with data, you know, we deal with data. And so we offer a field mapping class in May where you actually go out and collect data. Like Michael sitting right there, he went and collected the call box information for every single call box on campus. And we're gonna do some nearest neighbor analysis to figure out is it clustered? Is it dispersed? Is it random? What should it be? They better not be clustered because if you're walking around and you're not in that cluster, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. And so I think the creation of primary data, I think is an is important facet of understanding the data collection process. Because a lot of times you ask someone to fill out a form or a paper form, is it right? I know what I'm gonna say if someone asks me to fill something out. You better give me some, you better give me some motivation, you know, to fill out a form. So I'm not, I'm not you know what I mean? You know, or to collect, you know, you know, telephone poles or utilities and all that other stuff. And I don't want to go too much into these here, but I think there's some biases attached to collecting these data that we need to really, you know, we're, we're gonna have to use. Does someone want to go and recreate all these data? Neither do you. Okay, so we have all the school districts. Um, there's about 115 school districts because like Orange County has their own school district versus Carborough Chapel Hill schools. Um, where I grew up, there was like 400 school districts. So like my school district, I grew up in New Jersey. So like my school district only include like my high school and our sister high school. That's it. And then our township because counties have subdivisions called townships. And so like your police and all the kids you went to school with were in that township, you know, and all your taxes went to that, which are different from other townships and boroughs and you know, like cities closer to New York City. And here we have 115 school districts. So if it's like snowing in the southern part of Guilford County and the buses can't get to school, then guess what? Up in us in northern Guilford County, we're not we're not going to school. Or that for us, it's like the kids like literally across the street, like. They're not going to school, but I still got to go to school because they just don't you know, want to be. You know, because we live in kind of the corner of three different counties. And so what we have here are the LEA local education areas, reportable crimes, ADM, that's the number of students in grades 9 to 12, and then these are the reportable crimes per 10,000 students. Now, what I want to do is I just want to go and average up all these numbers. I want to average up the rates. Now, rates are really important because if I were to look at the number of crimes, does that really tell us anything? Not really, because if I were to sort these, and when we start to look at Excel, I can go to data. There's a sort right here, sort, and I can sort by different columns. So if I were to sort by reportable crime rate from largest to smallest, or not crime rate, but uh, reportable crimes from largest to smallest, you'd see Charlotte Mecklenburg has 40,000, 45,000. Oh, wow. Um, oh, reportable crimes. Charlotte, Wake, Guilford, Cumberland, Durham, Forsyth, Buncombe. What are you basically we looking at there? What do you know about all those counties? What's that? Big, the biggest county. Have a lot of people. We got a lot of people exactly. So we normalize those by rates. So the number of crimes 
divided by population or divided by AEM pop because I don't want to divide by total population because my grandmother is not committing the crime. We're only looking at the ADM, like the average daily rate, something like that. I don't know exactly what that means. Times a thousand. Why do I multiply it by a thousand? Why would I multiply it by a thousand? I can look at crimes per capita. I, I've heard this term per capita before. Okay, I can look at the total number of crime, you know, the crimes per person. If I were to look at the crimes per person, it's just going to be point. Number of crimes per person is point zero one five three four. Right, point zero one five three four crimes for every person. Basically, that number is six point four divided by divided by forty thousand six ninety five. Why do I do it per thousand? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. I don't know. I know what a thousand students looks like. What does point oh one five crimes really look like? What is Fifteen one thousandths of a crime look like. I don't know. I moved the decimal point over three points, and I know for every thousand students, what does a thousand students look like? Your high school? Wait, where'd you go, Clayton? I went to like probably Clark Riggs. Oh, we did. I didn't know that. Oh, you went to. You're from Clayton, right? Okay. Well, a, little, a little bit smaller than mine. My high school was like twelve, thirteen hundred students. So for every Class about 12 or whatever thousand students, you got about 15 crimes when we look at the actual rate. And so we just kind of give us a better frame of reference as opposed to that. All I did was move the decimal point over three places. When you move the decimal point over three places, what are you really doing? Multiplying by a thousand. Nothing, nothing, nothing really too tricky or major or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to average up all of these crimes. Okay, average up all these rates so I can get some descriptive metrics right here. And so all the way at the bottom, we can create some metrics right here. And I'm just going to type in the word mean. And I'm going to type in the word mean. I'm going to do median. Maybe I'll do standard deviation. Maybe I'll do variance. Because if you, once we do mean, you're going to figure out the rest real quick. Maybe we can do min. Maybe we can do max. And those of you kind of doing this or who have already done this already, no, it's pretty easy, but I've worked with like grown adults and you put that equals sign right there and like magical things happen and they never realized that they just thought like you can make green outlines and you can do schedules and all the other stuff. Like that's nothing. You can do it here. We're going to do, we're going to add something called the data analysis package and we're going to do simple regression. We're not going to do multi multi-linear regression, but we're going to do simple regression, two-tailed t-tests, all that other neat stuff that we can do here. Now, you don't have access to the data analysis package. You got to do a little options or something like that. And I have to do it every year. So I have to remember how to do it. But you got a new little tab here. All right. So me and I'm going to type in the word equal to sign right here. And now this is a whole other thing we can do. I can add up columns, subtract columns. And hopefully most of you know that. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just type in the word A, B, E, R, A, G, E. And when I see average, what's it say? Returns the average of the arguments, which can be numbers or names, arrays, or references that contain numbers. So I'm going to click on average. Now, average right there, it put a little parentheses right there. In math class, what's this little parentheses mean? What's that? Multiplication, or in this case, function. So it's going to take in arguments. Remember this from uh, data science work we do with things with Python, where it took in multiple arguments. I got to read all that stuff again. Okay, or the, the mid strings and all that other stuff. So what are the arguments? You grab all the numbers. It could be these two numbers, but these five numbers don't matter. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go highlight all these numbers right here. And then put an end. Okay, so that's my function. Remember that f of x equals two x plus three is one root two right there. And okay, and so what's it say there? Equals average e two e one sixteen. What do you think e two references? 
the name of the cell. What do you think E6116 is? All the way at the bottom. So like I said before, there's 115 of these here because E2 to E116, inclusive is that, that is subtraction, that, that the difference plus one. And then I hit enter. What do I have down there? 12.32. Well, let's try another one. Type in the word median. Equals median. Same exact thing here. Go all the way up to the top. Boom. 11.61. What's the difference? Could you tell me the difference between these? Why are they different? What direction they're skewed? Are they skewed? Are they skewed? The mean's a little bit higher than the median. So there's probably some higher values that kind of really put it off kilter a little bit. We can look at the distribution of these, but I want to do this in ArcGIS Pro because I this ArcGIS Pro is really easy. But like the Z scores that Chima did aren't quite as intuitive as they are here. All right, next, what do we got here? Hey, let's type in the word variance. Okay, and I can type it equals. Variance. Okay, we got V-A-R-A. I'm just going to click on the first one because to be honest with you, I don't really know the difference between these. Um, I'll just type the first one. And then this is the variance. What do you think the variance means? How far these value differ from the mean? What I care about more is the standard deviation. So equals STD standard deviation P. Most of these are the same. Most of those standard deviations are the same. The different variations depend on how they address null values. What's the word null mean? Nothing. Is it zero? What if I substitute null value with zero? Would that be, is that a good idea? Why not, Mary? Zero is still a value. Zero is zero. Like, you, when you say zero, you're like, hey, there was no crime here versus no, hey, we only need to, we can only do 110 calculations here versus 115. So we get rid of the nulls right there. And we can do simple tricks like sort these or select these or whatever. And this is where you kind of earn your big bucks. So standard deviation. I'm just going to highlight this too. So 6.5. What's the relationship between 4.37 and 6.5099? What do you think it is? It's just the square root of it. I like standard deviation a lot more than variance because now. I can start to visualize what this data looks like. If this were kind of normally distributed in my mind's eye, I'm looking at, okay, I've got, you know, 12.32. Most of my data is going to be here, this direction, 6.5, this direction, this triangle stands for delta 6.5. So most of my data is going to be what? Between, I don't know between like 5.7 and 18, about two thirds of it is between this, assuming this is a normal distribution, which it probably is. Mm -hmm. Now next, and these are descriptive metrics right here, descriptive. Okay, if I really wanted to, I could maybe equals mode. I don't think there's gonna be any modes, but we can check, you know, oh, modes, mode might be zero, that'd be weird. Do you think they're really zeros? I think I know the answer to that, but I don't think they're zeros. But, but the mode is zero. Let me see if there's a max. A maximum. Yeah, I guess there's a max, the largest value. the max 33.4 okay we can do the range 
Now, Cameron really likes this and Michael and whoever else, because they're like, remember in Python, remember in data science, we had to like go through and figure out which one had the highest number of features. And you're like, wait, the right programs to do all this. Like if it's higher, make it the highest. If not, keep the low, like, oh man. Now we're just high, low. And I'm sure we can use some pandas. Pandas are Python number data dictionary, something like that. You, you heard of pandas, right? You love pandas. Uh, you probably got to teach me some pandas. Geopandas. Oh, geopandas? Okay. Yeah, I've done a little bit of it when I was doing my Jakarta index stuff, but I've kind of pivoted away from it. I just still have pandas. But, um, but when we did those, I'm sure there's some pandas that can go through a data set and return min max instead of programmatically doing it like we did in. Um, Python class, where we just circled through and just said, all right, let's look at this, 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 because we had to load them up. All right, so we can get min max. Last thing we're going to do with this is we're going to look for the z-score. I'm going to put a little column right here. Uh, we're actually going to do a couple things. We'll do the weighted average, and then we'll do the z-score. Okay, here we're going to do z-score. So our z-score is going to be what? What's the formula for Z score? And the one thing about programming and ArcGIS and all this stuff is if I can put it into words, I can figure out how to do it on a map or with a computer. That's all it is. If I can put it into words, if you say it's this column minus this column divided by this number, geez, we've accomplished. This is this is the big thing where we look at, all right, let's break all these big, big problems down into smaller, smaller ones. Because when you get into the workforce, guess what? It's not like it's a homework assignment. It's like, it's like a semester project. <laughs> you know what I mean? You might have three of these semester projects going on at the same time, which is really ugly, really quickly if you, if you let it overwhelm. And so this Z score is equal to what? This X minus X bar over that standard deviation. So this X is the value, right? Okay, so X bar is the mean divided by the standard deviation. So all it's gonna be to calculate it, I can put in a formula. It's just gonna be, for the first one, it's gonna be 15.34, Okay, minus that mean divided by that 6.509. Mm -hmm. Couple ways we can do this. We'll kind of do it the easy way first, and then we'll do it the trickier way next. So I'm just going to type in the column. Okay, so it's going to be what? I'm going to put a little equal to sign since the formula equals this number minus, what was the average? Does anyone remember that average? 12.32 divided by what? 6.5099. We're, we're going to go back and do it a different way in a second. Now, is this the right formula here? What would your Aunt Sally say about this? They use parentheses. The uh, parentheses, right? Oh, okay, your aunt. Remember that? Please excuse my dear aunt Sally. All that other good stuff. Okay, so got this little parentheses right here. You guys thought I was going to click enter, didn't you? Okay. Now the other thing to think about when we looked at those charts, what the right answer look like? When we're looking at Z scores, what's a good Z score? And Chima don't answer because he's been mapping Z score for like the last year. What's an adequate Z score? Yeah, range of Z scores. Negative one to one is good. Usually your very lowest would be like negative three, maybe negative four up to four. That's about 
you know, when you're looking at like extremes. And so I get a number like this. So if I were to go through and calculate this and not have a parentheses there, you might have something really weird. And what's the first thing you're going to say? I get a 13.44. You know what most students are going to say? Okay, and we go to the next, the next, the next, the next, the next. Okay. So at the end of the day, these computers are stupid because they're going to do whatever you tell it to do. Okay, and it's going to be your job to say that number doesn't look right. Uh, let me go back. Okay, you know my Aunt Sally isn't happy. Let me give her these parentheses. Oh, all right. Now the other thing we can do here, and now what I can do is this: I can go and drop and drag here. Now, should there be negative numbers? Yeah, there could be negative numbers. There's there's going to be positive. You notice most of these when we look at these. Negative 0 0.67, 0 0.38, 0 0.14. What happens if they happen to be exact? What if the z score were exactly zero? What would that mean? Think about this formula. If this number, if the z score is zero, what would that mean? The mean and the value are equal to each other. I mean, yeah, yeah. 12.32 or whatever that means. Okay. What if I said, hey, okay, what if this, these, the standard deviation, what if the z score were equal to what? One equals, and I'm gonna, I'm just pointing this out here because you might see this later, but what if the z score were equal to one? What would the value be? Okay, x minus 12.32. Two, three, two divided by six point five. This is about as mathy as we're going to get. So don't don't get too scared. We're not doing calculus. I use this fancy word Poisson distribution. We just go through and calculate it using some input parameters with like gamma signals and all that. We don't. We just put those in. Can anyone solve this? Does anyone know how to solve this? Do you remember this? Let's just write it out. Remember, cross multiply. So 6.5 equals x minus 12.32. What's x equal to? Plus 12.32 plus 12.32 equals 18.82. And basically, all it is is the standard deviation plus the mean. Now, what about 1.15 standard deviation of the mean? Standard deviation times 1.15 plus 12.32. What if it were one standard deviation below the mean? 12.32 minus 6.5. So it's just real simple you know, algebra right here. And so don't get overwhelmed by these big fancy questions here because if I said, hey, the z score is 1.5 below the state, below the z score is negative 1.5, then the value's got to be below the mean. How far below the mean? That's the standard deviation is times 1.5, because this standard deviation kind of tells you how compact the data is. It's stretched out, like football teams that win 14 and 2 and 1, and or they really suck. Because at the end of the day, this is really just a generalization of the data. Generalization described kind of data. Now, another thing that we can do here, because I do want to open up ArcGIS Pro and we. Okay. okay. Now, this is kind of, I don't want to use the word Bush League, but this is kind of the Bush League way of saying it. I can put in, instead of saying minus, well, what column is that mean in? All right. E. 118 and the standard deviation is e121 so i've got a little trick right here and i always mess this one up i put dollar sign e dollar sign 118 divided by dollar sign e dollar sign 121 okay what did i just do right there Exactly, because now when I drag down, what am I doing? 
When I drag down, look what happens. It goes E11, E10, E9, E8, but the standard deviation, those other ones where the mean and the standard deviation are in the same spot, it's keeping those in the same place. So this little dollar sign says, keep them in the same place. Hey, divided by this column, but what is X? When we calculate it, we're gonna just move down, move down, move down, oops. Oh, escape. Okay. So we're just going to drag this thing down. So these numbers might change a little because we're going to get a little bit more precision instead of 6.5099 or whatever I had, 6.5099077784. Do we need all that precision? Not necessarily, but it'll help. And so now we can sort. Okay, let's go back and sort. Okay, data, sort. Let's sort on our Z score, Z score. Okay. Sort on Z score, Z score, large, small. All right. So now Transylvania County has a high Z score. And so now when I was comparing other quality of life indicators or quality of school indicators, this 33.04 means nothing when I start combining it with EOG scores or percentage of kids who are proficient at, in reading or everything else. That's why I love Z scores. That's why Chima loves Z scores. I love them, but we like them enough. And hopefully, in your research, you guys start thinking big picture. You know, we're no longer just undergrad. We've got some undergrads here, but you know, we're getting to 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 level class. We're like, you know, this is good. This is better. This is this kid stuff. Okay. Because now you see it, Transylvania County. Look at that. Where is Transylvania County? Isn't it way out west? We only have like 1,100 kids in the whole county that are grades, you know, 11. But look at all those crimes. Now, the last thing I want to do with this is I want to calculate the weighted average because our average was 12.32 but you saw that the median was 11 point something so you know it's going to be skewed a little bit because when i average it basically what happens that 33.04 counts the same as all these other counties does that 33.64 really count as much as the other counties no why because there's only 1100 students as opposed to other counties which have much higher rates there's a couple ways we can do this. We're going to calculate the weighted average, but in theory, what we could do is we could just add up all the crimes and divide by all the students and then calculate it and multiply. I want to do a weighted average because I think we're going to have an exam that has weighted averages. So I'm going to do the same thing. It's the same thing if we were to decompose the calculation. So there's a couple ways to do this. So add up all the crimes, divide by all the kids. Multiply it by a thousand, just move, move your decimal point over three places. Now, same thing. Now, I'm going to put a little column here called QP, quality points. When we did our GPA, formula for Z score, Z score is the value minus the average divided. Oh, let me put, I'll put it right here. There we go. Right there. Feel free to stop me right here as well. Okay. I'm recording the screen here so you can see the Z score is E2 minus E dollar sign E 118 because that's where the mean is. If your mean went down another one, you reference wherever the mean was that you, you're sticking right there. And then these are neat little tricks here. I've never taken an Excel class. I just know this is all the stuff I've picked up. So now this time, we got our quality points. Remember when you did your GPA, how did you calculate your quality points? Quality points. Yeah. Your class weight versus your. Yeah, your, your class weight times your um, GPA, the actual number of crimes or whatever it is, times your. So all we're going to do is just multiply column C and D. 
All right, so equals, click on little C2 times D2, hit enter. There we are. So these are like quality points. Okay, I call it QP because we call them quality points in when you do your GPA, right? The 4.0 times the credits, the 2.0 times the one credit. So see this column right here? It's a C2 times D2. So how do we calculate? Let's look at this weighted average. How do you calculate your weighted average? How do you calculate your weighted average in How'd you calculate your weighted average in your um, your GPA? Exactly. You added up this big nasty column and then divided by the sum of all the students. How, what's another word for adding up? Sum, exactly, sum. So we could do the sums right here or we can just say, hey, it's equal to the sum of what? All this stuff right here that we went through the trouble of calculating divided by the sum of what? How do I add up all the students? Exactly, just calculate this column here. Pop quiz, do you think it's gonna be higher or lower than your mean? Is the weighted mean gonna be higher or lower? I don't know either. Just me thinking about it, I think it's going to be lower because when we run the average on everything like we did there, Transylvania contributed the same for the calculation. Is Transylvania going to contribute the same for this weighted average? No. So just off the top of my head, that 33.04 is going to have very little contribution to this weighted mean compared to it being 1 1 15th of the previous average. Now I'm going to hit enter. And what would you do? What would you do, Cam? No, I'm just kidding. All right, sum, sum. Oh, I better divide by um, reportable crimes. Um, crime rate per thousand. Oh, I got to divide by the crimes. I'm sorry. I'm going to change this to C. See, I'm sorry. Okay, I guess I was all right. Well, give me a second. What did we do wrong? I swear I know what I'm doing here. Okay, G2 to G116. What am I doing wrong here, Chima? I'm doing something obviously wrong. What was the very first calculation that you did when you're looking at QP? You said it was C2 times D2. Was that the first? Yeah. Uh, C2 times D2. C2 times D2. That's your GPA times your weight. C2, it should, should be divided by some of You see what I'm doing wrong, Chima? 12.32. I got a feeling I'm like a decimal point off here and I 
Give me a sec. What do you see? C2 times D2. VAR 41,000. Weighted average. Some G2. Divided by G2, which is 116. But just for the heck of it. Boom. 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 Um, you said I'm here or yeah, there's something weird here. Um, yeah. It's like twice, twice what it should be. Ten fifty eight. This. All right. Then we did average. Oh, okay. Here's another way we can do it. Sorry about that. Uh, this will be an easier way. Um, yep. Equals instead of C2 times D2, we're accounting for this thousand. We're, we're off a couple decimal points. So what we're going to do is D, D2 times E2. There we go. Okay. There we go. Equals. All right, it's getting late, so that's why I'm, I don't know who to blame yet. So I'm I'm just figuring that out. All right, um, I was over the wrong column. It should be the sum of G two times G sixteen divided by population. I multiplied by the rate. Uh, I was doing these originally. I could have. I needed to account for this. I don't want to do calculations for three columns when I can just easily do calculations for two columns. And so this column is just the sum of the what? The average times the KDF. Basically, your GPA, your normalized GPA, one, two, three, four, on some type of ordinal scale times the weight. Now, you also notice. The weight, the weighted average was like 13. So I made that kind of assumption that that 33.34 would be real high. But if we look up the top here, we see Budcombe, Cleveland, uh, McDowell County. These high counties are all above the mean, which are still big counties above the mean, skewing it in that direction. So my assumption was still a little bit off. Okay. All right. Yes. D2, D2 times E2. Yep, my fault. D, I had to extract. Yeah, I had to. Yeah, I had to extract these numbers. So D2 times E2. This is like your grade times your weight. Grade times your weight. 
I accounted for this, but I already accounted for this using this and this to do that. So why do I have to go back and do it again? All right, so now I got my weighted average. The last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna open up exercise two. Hopefully it won't take up as much time. So I want us to unzip, open up exercise two. We'll look at a couple of questions there. And then we'll kind of be on our own and be done by, you know, eight or whatever. Now, I want to be done in like 15 minutes. So that's what I really want. That would be really helpful. All right, Mary Kimberly, you got it? Okay. Yeah, some, someone messed it up. So I'm just. No, it was me. It was me. Don't worry. I'll take the blame there. And so this is D times E. And then this average right here, and I want to highlight this for people coming back later, the sum of G2 divided by the sum of the weights. Now, what are the weights in your GPA? How many credits the class are? How, what are your weights here with this calculation? How many students are in each county? And so what we did here, we got a Z-score, we got a weighted average. Can we use this weighted average as part of the calculation for Z-score? I guess uh, I, I guess you can if you really wanted to, um, and you would just plug that calculation in there. I I wouldn't be heartbroken. Some status real statistician might be really angry at you for that, but I wouldn't. Okay, you know because it's it's not going to move it off too much. But I just want to make basically talk about and make sure we understand the concept that median, mean, and weighted average they're all measures of central tendency, but they're all different. Okay. The mean each county counts the same. The median just the measures the middle one and then the weighted average they're weighted based on population in this case the ADM daily ADM. Okay. All right. Last thing we're going to do we're going to open up the exercise do a couple of these in ArcGIS Pro and then we're going to call it the day. So we've got exercise number two. I've got textbook material. So just a couple of things that I've got here is that we've got textbook from a book called Sullivan. It goes through and uses some fancy formulas. I've got this book I really like from Mitchell about 2005 that introduced spatial measurements and statistics. I've got links to the North Carolina violent death reporting system so you can look at real world data. And I got a couple of except I've got a couple of videos I've created that talk about measuring the central tendency, dispersion, how to make powerful visuals, and migrating data between ArcGIS Pro and Excel. Where that now in ArcGIS Pro, we have a copy clipboard button. So I can just copy, paste it into Excel because I went through the trouble of exporting stuff to CSV files, but now I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> and so the integration between ArcGIS Pro and statistical software applications is really good. And at some point in time, we're going to do spatial calculations where I say, give me all rural, copy that to an Excel spreadsheet. Give me all urban, copy that to an Excel spreadsheet. Let's look at the difference in COVID rates to see if they're statistically different so we can reinforce, you know, theories or whatever, hypotheses, whatever we want to do. Because that's what we do. That's what your paper in this class is going to be. Like, hey, COVID rates, in urban areas were higher than rural areas. Now you gotta figure out what urban and rural means. You know, what, what's urban and rural mean? And we'll talk about those when we get a little bit more in to the GIS stuff. Now, uh, we've got exercise number two. I also have a reading here. I'm gonna have it, um, the first thing I'll, I'll mention here is this reading that I did a long time ago, not that long, 2022 with Dr. McGinn, who's in our department. This is a really easy read. Um, with GIS, but these, um, it's just a little paper that I did where I just grouped like a sociology paper, basically to run a little GIS and did it. My wife was taking classes at Guilford College. We were in Cancun and she's like, I need a paper written. So I was like, boom. And she was happy. I was happy and I got a publication out of it. And, but this is, this is a neat paper here that that's using some real simple data from the food access atlas because if they're trying to migrate from the term like food swamp and food desert even though i think those are pretty self-explanatory and we know what they mean 
So I've got this paper up there. I've got questions on it, and tomorrow I'll kind of in my announcement when I get onto it, I'll put the assignment. But I put like five questions. You answer questions about it, and then you you know submit it. So read it, understand it. The one thing about this here, and all my papers that I love to do, and I want people to get in the habit of, is get in the habit of putting a some. Hopefully here I did it. Um, I like to put research hypotheses in here, like saying, what, what am I trying to prove? Given these, this paper will explore if rural food security is a problem. Like I love to like bullet points and numbers right here. And this is, I've been doing like the last five years. This is my goal here. Is it a problem if it exists, what ages? And because right down at the bottom, you can read this part, and then you go all the way to the bottom, and I've got like my little bullet points here that I don't have bullet points here, but I answer exactly, you know, yes, no, maybe so, and what I do here. And so that's the way I do things. Hopefully, you know, you'll figure out what's best for you. But I'll talk about this because this is basically like a little quiz that you take that kind of elicits that you, you know, you kind of understood it and um, uh, you did it. Now, graduate students, they have to do all the readings. So, you know, basically you read the paper and these are like the little papers here. So what's metropolitan mean? Highest percentage of people. So just read the paper, make sure you understand these. This one gets a little, but just make sure you understand. This last one, people get a little hung up on, and I, I want to make sure people understand what food insecure means. Food insecure, bad. Food secure, good. You know, those sort of things here and getting used to some of the words that, that I've that I've used here because all these things mean different things, and I don't want you to guess on this. I really want you to internalize and articulate what we tried to show because I just told you before, higher percentage of people live in food insecure, people live in rural areas. And the title of the paper is debunking an urban myth, you know, so you get an idea as to what we're kind of looking at. And then when we look at things like. When we look at things like age and race and all these other things, you're going to see, unfortunately, really distinct differences. And then, you know, what we got here, nice, pretty tables right here. Number of census tracts, total population, percentage of population. We've got real simple descriptive metrics here, real simple. Down towards the bottom here, I've got a really neat table right here, meaning, hey, these are all the food insecure people, rural food insecure, rural food secure, good, bad. What are the chances that food insecure, twice as many black or African American live in food insecure as rural food insecure? What are the chances? Really, really low. If you were to grab 50 food secure census tracts, 50 food, in, in food secure and insecure, you think they should be random, right? Does this stuff show they're random? Mm -hmm. So even in rural areas, because we took it about here, around here, you know, where the kids have to go to school. You know, I was just at a meeting today and they were joking about, you know, we're putting a new Cinnabon on campus. You know, they love the Cinnabon, they love this, you know, because kids don't want to eat the salad. You know, but we got, they love the Cinnabon and Chick-fil-A and all that other, it smells so good. You know, I made a joke here about it, but those are some of the things when we put those in to practice. Where are students getting healthy food? They're not, you know, they're not, you know. Only reason why I dieted in high college is because I was a wrestler, I had to make weight. So, you know, you know, that's the only reason why I dieted, you know, and, but it, once I got on that, off that scale, I would eat garbage and junk and, you know, it was, not good. Okay, but this is really putting stuff into practice, you know, and these are probably maybe things that you see in your, you know, see in your communities. You know, I kind of have a passion for this, and hopefully you all have a passion for some of these projects, especially when I, you know, I can pick up bananas on the way home, my wife tells me to, but just think of some of the pains for people who don't have access to their individualized transportation. You know, I had a grandmother who, like, she, my mom took away her car, so how's she getting around? Like someone's got to come pick her up and drive her around because my mom didn't want her running someone over on them. You know, so how do those things happen? And imagine how those things are happening in rural areas. My grandmother lived in a town or city. 
imagine those things happening in rural areas. How are you going to get access to tra transportation? You know, you're going to pay for someone to come pick you up when you're probably already a marginalized population. You don't have the money to spend on it. So I don't want to go down to too many, too many rabbit holes over it. Those are things that I'm, uh, I'm passionate about. And more importantly, maybe facilitating some of that research in you because the data is out there. It's just a matter of detecting some of the patterns in it. So I like this paper here. All right, we'll leave it at that, but let's look at exercise two. I'm sorry for the tirade here. So we're going to just look at exercise two. I just want to make sure we're able to download something or download it, open it, and then create a chart and graph, and then I'll let you go on your own. So remember that zip stuff we did last week? Yes, Dr. Malone, you do. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. Oh, good. Thank you, David. Oh, Daniel. So. All right, so we're going to download this thing. Okay, I can right mouse click, save as. These canvas in your browsers act a little bit differently on everything. So, so I'm going to save it. And it's going to be sitting in your downloads right here. Uh, so exercise two, make sure when you click on it, you click extract all. If you're managing your data, save it to your, you know, EASC 5130 folder, whatever me, I'm just lazy. I'm going to save it to the easiest thing. And we want to get to a point where I've got the word document that you're going to turn in. Okay, so I've got some videos right here, some graphs. I've got some mean, median, range, standard deviation. Does that all that stuff ring a bell? Of course it does. Okay, and then for different counties. Now, what we're going to do here on our homework two, we're just going to double click on the exercise. And if our software is installed, what should happen? It magically opens up with us and we're all signed in and ready to go. Okay, and so, you know, I don't want to say I'm concerned. Most of the people in here, me and Chima are looking over your shoulders. And so we know that it's open. Those of you joining us online, make sure you have access to it. Those of you watching later, I'm looking directly right at you. Make sure you have it installed and ready to go. That's the biggest challenge that we run into is that people don't have the software installed. So they're doing the Excel stuff, but they're not doing much else. Now, when we open this up, when we open this up, I'm really opening it up. Does that map ring a bell to people? What's it look like? North Carolina, who completed the exercise? Cameron, does that ring a bell, Matt, ring a bell? That's the answer to number one from last week, okay? So that's, that's what you should be getting for the answer. You know, that's what you should be getting for the answer. Come on. My computer's not liking me right now. Come on. Okay, here it is. All right. Of course. Okay. So what I did was I went and averaged up the age at which people die of cancer. You would think that would be a random phenomenon, wouldn't you? The age at which people die of cancer by county. It's not. Where is it? Where is it lowest? Because here, this gets low. It's bad. Where is it low? All the wrong here. What are some of the reasons for that? Why are people dying of cancer at much higher rates? Might be race, but access to adequate health care. These are rural areas. These other things that you that are a blend of. Maybe there's bad water and all that other stuff we you hear about in the news. So it's a combination of environmental kind of the human built environment factors as well as natural environment factors combined with social factors and as well. So we've got this right here. I, I think it's neat. 
What's going on in this county where the average age is so low? Think about demographically in this state. What in this state? Why? Because remember, high surround by high, low surround by low. But we can kind of put just these here. What's this? Why is this so low? Big question. What do you think I want? What's that? People traveling. Traveling? All right, maybe you're on the right. What county is this? Swain County. Who lives in Swain County? It's right. What? Well, <laughs> ne well, nobody does, but the average age of which people die of cancer. It's right next to Cherokee County. Who lives in Cherokee County? Native Americans. Okay. So when we think about marginalized populations, a lot of times we, what do we think about? We think about African American or Hispanic, but we've got Cherokee here. Another county right here is Robeson County. Who lives there? Lumbee. So when we talk about marginalized populations, there's there's a lot of those here in the state that we look at. And we've got these minority majority areas, and these counties in the northeastern part of the state are largely or majority African-American, but we have these other counties out here that are Lumbee, Cherokee as well. And you know, what, what about access to transportation and access to adequate health care? Unfortunately, in this day and age, we know that it's not equal or adequate or equitable or whatever word we want to use. And so, you know, there's a lot of good whys behind this here. Now, I'm kind of going off on my social justice tangents right here, but I want to make cool charts and graphs out of this because at the end of exercise one, we went and made a map out of this. This is what exercise one looks like. And all you do is just add a legend in the north there and all that other good stuff. But what we're going to do is add a little to this and then you're going to go through and maybe copy some of this stuff into Excel and do what we just did for everything. So we're going to right mouse click. Open attribute table. Okay, and I've got this is a what I have here is a separate. Feature class, so a separate feature class that has joint count. What do you think that joint count means? How many people that died? Age units. And so I created this with a previous version of GIS software instead of it attaching to that NC counties right there, which we'll utilize here in a little bit. But one of the things we can do here under age units, right mouse click, sort ascending, we know what that does. Sort descending, we know what this, this does. I field, calculate field, statistics. Click on statistics. What are we looking at? And if I click on properties to the left, what do I have here? For the age unit, what is this thing? Look at this. Age units, I got a mean, a median. Did everyone get this? It's, oh, it's yours. Mine are slightly off. I don't understand why, but. Uh, you're slightly off. I'm not sure why. Maybe because I don't know who to blame. So um, if you picked like two or three counties, you know, so if I pick two or three counties, it might do it for just the two or three counties. I'm not really sure. Does it look something like this? Yeah, yeah mine is very close. Okay. Uh, the number of bins or whatever. Wow. I want to control also lead yeah. and get rid of some of those processes. All right, so what we've got here, when I click on properties, and I, I want us to get out of here in the next couple minutes here. 
When I click on properties, I can click on mean, median, standard deviation. Min of 66 and max of 75. So there's a nine year difference in the age of which people die of cancer. Nine year difference. It's like 15, you know, whatever, almost 18% difference just based on the county in which you live in, the age of which you die of cancer. Okay. We have a count, rows 100, count 100. Does that make sense? That 100 number makes sense. How many counties for North Carolina? 100. So we don't have any null values. Min 66, max 75. Some skewness and kurtosis basically tell us how, um, how high it goes and then how squished it is. These are kind of the numbers. Squished isn't the right term. Um, I can label the bins right here. If I want to do, I can change the number of bins. So if I put label bins, I got one, one, two, four, eleven, nine, twenty-four. But you see this standard deviate, you know, you see this normal this generally normal distribution. Now, if I want to, I can just do a screenshot. Or right here, I can go to export and I can export it as a graphic or export it as a table. So I can go and export it as a uh, SVG, PNG, or JPEG. Does everyone know how to do that export? Yes. Okay. I think people are better at this than probably me. So <laughs> um, I could also do a little screenshot here. So I can click my screenshot button, do the same thing here. So I can screenshot it. Just like I said before, it's not going to be saved as a dedicated file. So it'll just be as like an object that I can cut and paste in the Word. So I can't go back later and manipulate it or whatever in some sort of image processing software. So you, you've got that there. But now this kind of graph here is stored as its own unit. So I could stick this into a Word document or whatever else I wanted. The last thing I can do here is I can right mouse click on counties and open my attribute table. Because what I'm starting to do later is, hey, open this stuff up, calculate the mean, median, mode, z-score, all that other stuff. Are you going to do it in ArcGIS Pro or are you going to do it in Excel? You can do it in Excel. You can do it in either one. How do I put all this stuff into Excel? I can just export it or watch this. I can click this button called Switch. Basically, Switch captures everything. And now, look what I have here. Copy. And now I've got a brand new Excel sheet right here, and I'm going to do what? I swear I'm going to do it. <laughs> there we go. All right. Paste it. And now I'm asking for POP 2013 median age. You get rid of all the other garbage, for lack of a better term. Because this is what we call SF1 data, short form one data. I don't care about the maps attached to it now. I care about the actual data where I go and calculate the z-scores, standard deviation, mean, median, mode. Okay. I have a column here called white. What do you think white means? Number of white people within the county. You know, Hispanic, multi-race. I've got everything. You know, sitting right here, ready to go. And so now when we start working with real data, you're going to have it garbage like this. And then you're going to make executive decisions to go and delete individual columns and then just work with the nice, pretty stuff that we worked with that I had curated in, you know, the downloadable exercise one, three columns. So make your life easier, make your life really easy. You know, all right, so we've got the questions here. They should be pretty straightforward here. So exercise 2, we're starting at the end of exercise 1. Um, I have a couple of questions about migrating between ArcGIS Pro, um, working with text files, CSV files, what's the advantage of a weighted mean over arithmetic mean, um, give an example of two sets of data that have the same mean, but different, but different measures of dispersion. Me, for this, I would just list, hey, football team A1 or whatever, baseball team A1, you know, 50 games, 100 games, 50 games, 100 games. This has a standard deviation of this. Well, this team had 75, 76, 75, 76, had the same averages, but 
different standard deviations. Okay, standard deviation is a descriptive data set that tells how volatile the data set is, how much it deviates away from the mean, or that other stuff. If you were to graph it, you go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, where that stuff stays the same. I mean, data stays the same. Okay, I've got a graph here of median age. Can we make a graph of median age? You bet. Okay, can we make a graph of age units? Yeah, we just. We just did that. Okay, so make sure you differentiate between the two feature classes between the counties and the spatial join. And now I got POP 2013, mean, median, range, standard deviation. Can we calculate those? Exactly. If we can't calculate the range, you do the min minus the max. Pretty straightforward. Okay. And so I know everyone knows how to do this. I'm going to see if you're going to be able to do it easy because we shouldn't be hand calculating anything. Let Excel be your best friend. Let it be your best friend. If you're hand calculating stuff, that's cool that you kind of have a brain fart on the exam, but make sure you know how to do it um, in Excel because we're, we're not, you know, we're not doing formulas, we're not doing any of that other stuff. Okay, I want you to be able to interpret and understand and effectively communicate how, what these things mean versus other data sets like median age or average family size or joint count or whatever. All right, so I'll leave it at that here. I know a couple of people wanted to meet with me afterwards online. And so, for the next five days, just bother Chan because um, I'm I'm going to be bringing my my, my pink dolphin bathing suit. And, you know, I really have one with pink dolphins. I want to embarrass my wife while you're out. So I'm um, about that, and I'm gonna be gone. But really, if you do have, uh, you know, I do. We'll have some time in the evening. So if you do run into a problem, let me know. But any of the big problems about something not being available or I, I missed something. And then probably in the next two days or so, I'll have this recording posted up here. And I don't think there'll be any need to go through the exercise since I think we covered a good bit of it. So I will see you all later and have a good one. Okay, Lamana, yes, it will be put on Canvas. Yep. I try to record it, I save it in the cloud so it gets a little bit. Um, yeah, so I will save it and uh, put it in the cloud. Uh, it's put in the cloud and I'll just post it and save it to um, YouTube. But that takes some time to post up there. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. All right, let Bye. me stop recording. Stop.